Good morning. Welcome to Bethany Lutheran in Warren, Oregon. Today I'm preaching from the third chapter of the book of Luke, verses 1 through 20. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Licinius, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked, teacher, what should we do? He said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? He said to them, do not exhort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod, the ruler, who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When the Transcontinental Railroad was being built in the U.S. after the Civil War, the Central Pacific Railroad going from west to east laid 690 miles of track, while the Union Pacific Railroad going from east to west laid 1,086 miles, meeting in Promontory, Utah. The reason why the Central Pacific Railroad Company laid so much less track is because they had to engineer and prepare the way through the Sierra Nevada mountains. When the Central Pacific Railway was making the path straight through the mountain pass, the Union Pacific Railroad Company covered four times the amount of ground through the American Plains. It was incredibly hard labor to cut a path for the railway through a mountain range. Several teams of men would hammer wedges into solid rock to create holes for sticks of dynamite. 
Next, the dynamite was set off to blow off a few more feet from the mountain. Then all the rubble had to be cleared away and the process was repeated. At times, only a few inches of flat surface were claimed day by day as a mountain pass or tunnel was created. Luke, the author, author of our gospel text, is describing the construction of a salvation highway. Rome had built an incredible road network throughout the known world, complete with highways and bridges. It provided for faster and easier travel than ever before in recorded human history. Trade routes and communication flourished because of it. Then, as prophesied by the prophet Isaiah, here comes John the Baptist as the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. However, the wilderness, some translations say desert, is not the wasteland of Israel. This wilderness, this dangerous, deserted, lonely place is within us. This area filled with obstacles is the area that needs to be prepared for the Lord. Lord, I'm not quite ready for you. I've got a lot of clutter to clear away to make room for you. Some of my habits even trip me up. They need to be discarded before I let you in. I need a little more time. I've had a run of bad luck, but I just know that it's about to change. As soon as I get my next paycheck, I'm going to bet on that new horse. You know, she's a long shot, but when she wins, I can pay up all those missed mortgage payments before my husband even knows what I've done. Then I'll be ready for you. Isaiah said, every valley shall be filled. Lord, I know my life has sunk pretty low. Actually, it's in the gutter. But it wasn't my fault. I mean, every time I turn on my computer, those sites just pop up. So what if I open up that site and watch for a while? It doesn't hurt anybody. And I only used the office computer so that my wife wouldn't catch me. I didn't know the IT folks could watch what I was doing. It's not a big deal, though. I'll find another job before she even finds out. What crooked roads need to be straightened in your life to prepare for the Lord's return? Lord, I want to follow you just as soon as I sow my wild oats. I don't want to miss out on my friends' parties. They're insane, or at least the parts I can remember. Isaiah prophesied that every mountain and hill will be made low. Lord, I don't think I can clear away the mountain of debris and waste in my life. They say three strikes and you're out. Actually, three strikes and I'm in. For life, they say. If only I hadn't snuck out that night. If only I hadn't taken my gun. If only the owner hadn't come home early and caught me in his house. If only I wasn't already on parole. I guess you can just forget about me, Lord. I'll never be ready for you. Our prophesy says the rough ways will be made smooth. Yeah, sure, that sounds good, Lord, but my life will never be smooth. I mean, I've been drinking since I was 11 years old. It's all I know. I really did try to quit when I was pregnant, but it was just too hard. And now, my daughter's life is messed up because of me. I can't stand watching her struggle so hard in school, knowing it's all my fault. I destroyed my life, and now I've destroyed hers before it even began. It's too late for both of us. There are a lot of crooked roads, insurmountable mountains, and valleys too deep to traverse in this life. And yet there's good news in those places. 
In the same chapter of Isaiah, God says, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. And Isaiah tells us, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles, and they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And in chapter 49, Isaiah says, To the captives say, Come out, and to those in darkness, be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat them down. He who has compassion on them will guide them and lead them beside springs of water. I will turn all my mountains into roads and my highways will be raised up. My friends, do you hear this? Luke's verses about filling valleys and leveling mountains and straightening crooked roads this is what God will do for us. Jesus already did the hardest part when he went to the cross to pay the penalty of sin for us. He blasted away the insurmountable mountain between us and God. And if we turn to him, he will complete the rest of the hard work. Jesus will clean up our messy lives. He will straighten the crooked paths that we take in this life. Because even though in these days we have the word of God, we have the operating instructions for this life, we still listen to the lies of the world around us. We still look in the wrong places for hope. We look to Washington. Wall Street, and Hollywood. We even look in the shadows on the dangerous paths through the desert. Luke makes it clear that we will not find what we need in those places. If we want hope, we should look to the little white clapboard churches in the middle of nowhere, because there we will find sermons preached full of Jesus and full of grace. Look to those who show up week after week to shovel rotting, stinking muck so that those left homeless in the wake of Hurricane Helene can start to rebuild their homes. And when they sit down for a break, they pray with those who feel hopeless. Look to those who wander the back streets and alleys in the cold and dark nights to deliver sandwiches, blankets, and a word of hope to the hopeless and forgotten in our cities. Look to the foster parents who get up in the middle of the night to take in one more child and fulfill that child's hope for a safe and loving home. But pastor, you say, we are watching and waiting for the Messiah. We are on the path that leads us to Christ. What should we do? Well, John responds with verse 11. Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. We are to bear fruit. Live a lifestyle of radical generosity and integrity. Share what we have so that everyone has what they need. If this world is ending, then let us live the way of the world that is to come. We have nothing to fear from the wrath to come. So let us live a remarkable life 
in ordinary circumstances. And wait, not in fear, but in joyful anticipation for the time when at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen.